Listen, it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Trent Orth and his lovely wife, Layla, who just graduated from dental school in April. And the, basically, after you graduate, you get six weeks off to get your license and all that. So you decided to come down to uh, Phoenix where 10% of the population is Phoenix. Did you know that? It's Canadian. Really? Oh, yeah. It's that. 10%. When you talk to any realtors in any given year... 10% of the houses flip in all the largest cities in the United States. And, and, you know, and in Phoenix, it's 10% Canadian. Snowbirds. Um, yeah, snowbirds. And then when the dollar, the Canadian dollar is always, uh, whenever the Canadian dollar goes up and the U.S. dollar goes down, they, they start unloading into houses here. So how, how's, the dollar, how's the Canadian U.S. dollar trading right now? Poorly, to my knowledge. What is it, like 70 Seven, cents? No. 75? Yeah. Something 75 like cents to a dollar? Something like that. I haven't checked in a while, but yeah, it's something like that. So anytime we, anytime we come down here, we're always thinking like, you know, we're going to buy something, really how much is it really going to cost? Yeah. So it feels expensive. So, you're, so your dad is a, uh, is a dentist. And so, so, so first of all, um, I, I like doing a variety show. I like, you know, we just, the guy before you was the vice president of uh, Three Shapes, selling oral scanners. Um, um, we have specialists on. We have... Uh, old people like me on that are that have already done it thirty years looking back, but I, but I think a lot of people uh, want to know what what you're thinking just coming out. You just graduated from dental school, how? And your father's a dentist, yeah. So you're a second generation dentist. Were there any other dentists in the family? No. Yeah. So so tell us um, about your journey and what what does it feel like to have just graduated from dental school? Feels good. Feels weird now that I don't have any more school to do, but it feels really good. So. Um, I did eight years of school total, so I did four years of school before dental school, four years of dental school, and I did, you know, right out of high school, I did a year, then I went on an LDS mission, actually to Arizona. Really? Yeah. LDS so, mission to Arizona? Yeah. So I was down here for a couple of years, then I went back and did three more years of school, and then went into dental school, so. Yeah. So where was your mission in Arizona? So technically it was the Tempe mission. So the boundaries, though, of that, it included Ahwatukee, which is, you're in Ahwatukee, right? Right, this is Ahwatukee, right we're in Ahwatukee. It's, it's actually Phoenix, Arizona, Ahwatukee. So Phoenix is a million people, and at the bottom of it is the largest city park in America. It goes from 48th Street down to zero to 51st Avenue. It's a 100-street long park. And south of that is this little sliver of land where 85,000 people live. So it's about t less than 10% of the population. And it's called, it was Ahwatukee, but they annexed us. Pretty much right when I got here 30 years ago. Okay. So it is Phoenix, Arizona, but if you ask anybody in Ahwatukee, do you live in Phoenix? They say, no, I live in Ahwatukee. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of the identity. Yeah, so I mean, the mission that I was in then, it, it went down to Yuma, and it also went up to kind of St. John's, Arizona area too. So kind of right across the state. And so Tempe to Yuma to St. John's? Yes, yeah, so, and you went to ASU too, right? Yeah. So, so I was on ASU as well. I was a missionary on ASU. They have a huge, probably, I don't know what year you went there, but or if the LDS Institute building was there It was 98, for me. Okay, so they have a huge LDS Institute building there now, and I spent a lot of time there as well. So. Yeah, um, my favorite Mormon missionaries is I've lectured in um, 50 countries, and what's really neat is if you go there as a tourist, you know, you stay at a resort, you do all the tourist trap stuff, you hear all the tourist stories, you know, that's baloney. But I get to be picked up by dentists that are bringing in, and you get to really learn about the country. And I always tell them, I don't want to stay in a Marriott, I've stayed in a thousand Marriott's, I want to stay in your house. Because it's so cool to be in their home and see how do people, what does a refrigerator look like in Rio de Janeiro versus Warsaw, Poland? I'm, I'm never forget. When I opened up March and Delucky's or a refrigerator in Poland, and it, it was just sausages. <laughs> and, and, you know, you hear all these things about <laughs> about Polish people loving sausages. It was like white, gray, and then they had different fruits. But it's, it's basically you just ate sausages and tomatoes and, you know, all these different dishes. But what's so cool is, you know, you can spot a Mormon missionary a block away. You know, they got white shirts, a tie on a bicycle, whatever. Yeah. And they're young, and they just got out of college. And I remember um, in so many third world countries, I, um, I love economics, I love macroeconomics, and I'd say, so, why do you think they're poor? 
I mean, we all live on the same planet, you know, we, and it looks like, you know, we're in Costa Rica, you could grow anything, you know, we're in uh, Jamaica, whatever. And their fresh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed insights are just amazing because you don't realize that 55 years of reading all the books and the press, on you get really brainwashed and drained and you eventually drink the Kool-Aid. And they talk to some 20-year-old baby who just left home and is knocking on all these doors and hearing their problems and all. It's just, it was just amazing, just amazing. But the economists were right because what they continually tell me, and I've talked to them in a dozen different countries, is that when um, the economists always say that if you don't have rule of law, and you have lying, cheating, stealing, corruption, nepotism, it just is poverty. And every one of them would say the same thing. They'd say, well, it's the breakdown of the government and the family. And when the government, when everybody's lying, cheating, and stealing, and the, even the police are stealing and taking bribes, and then the family, uh, there's no dad's home raising the kids, how do you become a productive society? And it's, it's really refreshing to hear all, all those views. Mm -hmm. so, so how jaded are you just walking out of dental school now? <laughs> What do you mean? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> so, 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 what does it what does it feel like? I mean, so do you does what does a dentistry look like to you? Do you think um, one of the questions I always ask in economics is um, they ask parents uh, their level of optimism. Do you think your children will be able to have a life as great or greater than yours? Um, do you see you know the consumer confidence index is one of the greatest predictors of the economy because if you look forward and think it's dark clouds and skies, then you don't want to go buy a house, a car. If you're afraid of losing your job, you don't want to spend money uh, eating uh, out for lunch. You want to take a, a lunch pail and save money. So do you think um, that you can have a dental office and career as great or greater than your father? Honestly, I don't know what to expect coming out of school. I think, for one, like when I talked to my dad and what his student loans were like, when he came out of dental school, obviously they were a lot less. But then when I talk to my friends who went to school, like I have some friends that went to Midwestern um, down here, and I talk to them about their student loans, it makes me feel, you know, really lucky. So what was the price of Midwestern? What, what is that about? Isn't, I think it's something like, it's almost 100 grand a year yeah, or something like that, really. So they're, they're coming out $400,000 Yeah, something that. like that. Maybe a little bit less. Maybe something like 70 or, and that, you know, that's U.S. dollars, too. So, so nice how much situation. student loans are you going to have? So right now, walking out of school, you know, some of that was from living and everything, too, but... You know, we're sitting at like $170,000 Canadian, which is something like, I think, 130 or 135 U.S. So just a really nice car. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess so. So, so you, uh, you bought a Porsche, <laughs> and they, uh, it's invisible. Here, by the way, here's your Porsche. There you go. Take it and put it in your pocket. So you bought a Porsche and didn't get the car. They, you bought it, they stole it. Um, but um, are you optimistic about, um, are, you, are you optimistic about Cal Calgary? Alberta, Canada, which is just north of Montana. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think so. You know, no, coming out of school, I talked to a lot of dentists. Everyone still says you can do well. Everyone says, a lot of my friends that are dentists that, that have been out for, I, don't know, I guess, zero to five years or something like that, they say you don't really have anything to worry about. But, but I just don't know what to expect, you know, because I also talk to dentists that have a really hard time that come out and they're working for, you know, they've worked for different dentists and... They were promised things out of school from these dental offices, and then they get there, and it's nothing that they were promised. So you I mean, feel like in my they, situation, they, they, they were promised at, from employers or corporate yeah, they were promised from. Or, I don't know if it was a corporate office or if it was like a solo dentist or whatever, but but you know they were promised. You know they'll come out of school, you'll be busy four or five days a week. You know, and, and they move their families to certain places, and they get there, and they're they're not busy. You know, they're working a couple of days a week, and they're less busy than they were at their old jobs. So. But I think given the situation that, you know, I will be coming out, I'll be working for my dad, I, I feel like it, it'll be a better situation that I'll actually have a good mentor, which is something that's really important to me, at least the first few years coming out. So I feel really lucky that I'll have, I think I'll have a really good mentor, me and my dad, we have a really good relationship. Um, I like the way that he views dentistry and practices dentistry, so, so I'm excited to learn from him. So, so I'm pretty optimistic about at least learning you know, hopefully how to run a business and also, also learning about more about dealing with patients, more about different procedures. But as far as the market goes, I, I don't know what to expect, you know, about, like I said before, you know, my dad's downtown Calgary, it's 
It's an area that there's been a little bit of a recession in Alberta, so a lot of people have lost their jobs. So he's lost quite a few patients, I think, too. So, so I, I don't know what to expect with that, but, but uh, yeah, like I said, I'm optimistic. So de demographics matter. The, the, they matter huge. And if you look at um, um, Calgary or Alberta is where the tar sands are. And when yep. you go to Saudi Arabia, you know, you don't even have to drop a thousand feet and you have oil ready to go into the barrel. I mean, just almost, I mean, I mean, I think they, ha I think Saudi Arabia's average barrel, they have $4 into it by the time it goes to the refinery. Um, but to extract it out of the sands is a very expensive process. So when oil was, um, you know, um, basically uh, trading at, you know, a hundred dollars a barrel, the, that state was booming. Yeah. But then it dropped all the way down to uh, very low. Um, I love these charts where they don't have. Uh... So so it got all the way down in two thousand. Oh, so in two thousand eight, it was a hundred and forty five dollars a barrel, and then by two thousand nine, that was when the economic collapse was. So two thousand eight was uh, Lehman's day was two thousand nine. So it was it was at one hundred and forty five dollars a barrel, and it dropped all the way down to thirty dollars a barrel. But at thirty dollars a barrel, it's been trending up, 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 and now um, it's um, it's past seventy five, headed towards a hundred. Um, so, do you think that's uh, sustainable? Do you think that price is going to last? I hope so. <laughs> well, all the all the um, all the big brains on Wall Street think it is. But at seventy dollars, are you start are they starting to uh, rehire? Well, for, first of all, when it was a hundred and um, thirty, whatever. Um, companies have no incentive to work smarter. They just uh, they just throw money away and all these processes. So when oil collapsed, what was really great about the tar pits is they they started to have to think. Okay, we don't have the luxury of just wasting money. So they really squeezed their cost out. So the the oil wouldn't even have to go back up to that high again. But the, but the economy would come back. But um, so I, I would be bullish on oil until the last drop. I mean, like people always talk about, you know, wind and solar and all this crap like that. Wind and solar is not even 1% of the United States electricity. I mean, we're still 20% nuclear powered. And uh, so, um, you know, when um, you, you look at um, electric cars and driverless cars, man, that's a dec That's going to be 10 years away before you have a solar powered, windmill fed electric car to take you to the grocery store. So right now it's oil and gas. Yeah, well, that's a big thing in Alberta. Like that's what Alberta is known for is it's oil and gas, and that's what and then agriculture the too. Yeah, I mean farming is a big thing, and what is the most areas of Alberta? Small grains. I have no idea. Do you know? <laughs> were you were you born there too? No, I'm from BC. British so she's Columbia. from Vancouver, British Columbia. That area, yeah. Yeah. So was it a culture adjustment going that far yeah. inland? <laughs> Because Vancouver, <laughs> British Columbia, that's like the coolest city. I, I think it's the coolest city in North America. It's that or San Francisco. It's pretty cool, yeah. Oh, my God. It is so cool. I was cool. born in Vancouver, and then I uh, grew up on the island and Vancouver kind of island? central BC. Yeah. So Kelowna, have you heard of Kelowna, BC? No. Mm. It's kind of like the, they call it like the Hawaii of Canada. It's the... Everyone goes there for summer vacation. and Yeah. So beautiful. so you, you so left for, uh, for love, huh? No, I actually left to go to Calgary. I was done school and I went to Calgary to work and I and then we met five years later and that's why I stayed. I was actually gonna move back to Vancouver. I had planned to give it another six months in Calgary and, and then move back. So what what met. do you do now? Uh, I'm a massage therapist and I have a small online business. Nice. Yeah. Well, you're online now. Uh, you sell something to my homies. What, what do you sell online? I, I'm actually, I just have a, a vintage shop online. Clothing, mostly. Yeah? Yeah. So, so how many kids did your father have? Five. Did any of them go into dentistry, or were you the only one? No. Uh, two brothers, two sisters. My two brothers are both business owners. So I have a brother who owns a concrete company in Calgary. And the other one owns a kind of a cell phone company in Calgary too. So, so, so when are you going to start? So you're going to get your license. How many weeks do you get your license? So we officially graduate, like we walk the stage on June 9th and then June 11th is the first day I'll work. So I'll get my license, I think is on June 7th is officially when I can go and register for it and get it. And when you go work with your dad, are you going to have a written contract? 
No. Okay, that, that's your first mistake. Okay, when you guys got, got married, did you have a prenuptial? No. Okay, that was your first mistake. <laughs> and this will be your second big mistake. No, no, I, I get it. You know, uh, you're in love. You want to live forever. That, that, that's great and romantic, and that works half the time. But when you go work for your father, um, you know, I've seen this rodeo several times. Say, say your dad dies, and then you say, okay, I'm going to buy this practice for this amount of money. Then your five, then your five siblings like hell no is worth more than that. And we each get twenty percent, and so then you go work for your dad. Then you have a falling out for whatever reason, and then you go across the street and sit up. And now your dad's like, no, you can't sit across the street from me. You just got to get in writing because um, it's so important. Um, you know, you know, when they when they say marriage fails a third, a third, a third on money, sex, and um, substance abuse, it's really not even about those three. It's about they didn't talk about those three. Like, take substance abuse. You come home from work, I know you're LDS, you don't drink. Um, but you come home, you get married, and you drink a beer after work every night. Then it drifts to two, then to three. Next thing you know, it's six a night and a 12-pack, and she just leaves them. But they should have communicated it way back then. Same thing with money. I mean, money. I mean, how many of these dental offices don't even have a budget for the year? 100% of the Fortune 500 has a budget Somewhere between Thanksgiving and MLK Day, January 15th, for the whole year. I mean, I deal with these companies um, all the time. And then you go into a dental office. What's your budget for the year? I don't know. What do you spend on advertising? I don't know. What do you spend on labor? I, they, they, don't, they don't have a budget. So, so when you go to a marriage, I mean, the importance of sitting down and talking about money. And then for monkeys... When you actually uh, sit down and look at this, like you say, oh, I get a Starbucks every morning. But it's not on QuickBooks Pro. It's not itemized. When you sit back and then you guys look at each other and say, we spent two grand at Starbucks last year. And and then you start looking at all these expenses. So with your father, um, it, I just can't tell you enough. I know you love your dad. And uh, I my dad was my idol. And, um, and uh, but um, my gosh, um, get a contract. Get it in writing. You get an exit price. What happens if he dies? How do you buy it? And then here's another thing. Let's say your dad's been working there. He's 63. Yeah. So he's like been that. working there. And let's let's say his practice is worth a dollar. But 63 is old, dude. I'm 55. I mean, yeah, 55. You can't see as good as when you're 45. And, um, you know, he. so he's slowing down. Then here comes a 30-year-old energetic whippersnapper who's bouncing off the walls and squeezing in same-day dentistry and working through lunch. And you build that practice from a dollar in value to three, and now he wants to, uh, and, then you, and then your dad dies, and then your, your siblings value it at three, and you're like, wait, I, I built two of that three. Mm -hmm. So to get a purchase price, and um, do you plan on partnering with them, or do you feel like dating them for a year first? We're just going to see how it goes for a couple years, probably a year or two years, and then see what, what we want to do. So I don't even know for sure if I'm going to necessarily buy his practice or not. I, I don't know. Um, but he is looking to sell. But he's look, yeah, he's looking, he's to, retire looking to retire in the retire. next few years. So, so well, it's him then. So I mean, I I would like to ideally, I would love to buy his practice, and if everything goes well, do that. But I mean, we haven't agreed to anything, or you know, we've just kind of said, let's see how it goes for a year. He's really willing to be a, a mentor to me. That's what he said to me. And well, your your so. your dad, your mom, your siblings, everybody will sigh relief. If you get clear and transparent, you know, transparency is, um, you know, everybody um, says, you know, governments need to be transparent. They need to be checks and balance. You know, we don't have a king. We have a we have checks and balance between a, an executive branch, a congressional branch, a judicial branch. And you need to be transparent. And all through time when uh, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And then when you don't know what they're doing in the back room, the next thing you know, they invade Poland or something, you know. So, so to get transparent with what's going on, what are the numbers, let's get a contract, um, it's just, just, it just means everything. And then uh, you guys can get a game plan. And you don't have to pull the cord. It's just, if we do this, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. But it's all in writing 100%. So what kind of, um, and then the other thing in dentistry is the, um, you know, we sell the invisible. I just can't say that enough. I mean, you know, I know what an iPhone is. I, I get the brand. I know what a um, Hershey's chocolate bar is, bottled water. You know all these things. But when your engine light comes on and you grow up, I grew up with five sisters. I played Barbie dolls till I was 12. And I pull into a garage and I don't I don't even know what it, uh, lifters are, spark plug. You know, they always say, you're... 
You're... They might as well just speak Greek. I'm sitting there analyzing this guy, and I, I go to Grulik because he's been across the street for me 20 years. I know his wife and kids go to the same school mine does. I know he's a good guy, so when he's saying, wah, 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 I'm just like, cut the shit. How much is it when I get my car back? And he says, okay, I have to keep it till Monday, and it'll be $1,100. Fine. So it's trust. So when they come into your dental office and you say you have four cavities, well, they, 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 you know, what are they supposed to do? Google four cavities? I mean, they, they don't know. So having your dad has been there how long? Uh, he's been in the downtown area for 30 years. Oh, so. my God. And then your marketing is second generation. And then your dad was there 30 years. And, and uh, he sold it to his son. And uh, uh, an embellish the story, say you're his only son, you know, I'm just and uh, you know, and it, it's a game of trust. So when they walk in there, then you and then then you're marketing, you know, serving Calgary since what year was that? He graduated in '82 and they moved to Calgary in '88. So I would assume he's been in the downtown area since somewhere around '88. So, so all your marketing serving Calgary since 1988. Second generation, uh, and then and then the um, the other thing is when uh, how long has staff been there? How many staff has he got? Uh, two hygienists, two assistants, and then and two long? front end. So two, two, and two, and how long yeah. would you say they they've been there on uh, average? His his front end receptionist, she, his office manager, she's been there. I don't know how long, honestly, maybe fifteen or twenty years or something like that. Yeah. And then he's had a couple hygienists that are pretty long term too. I think between five and ten years or something. Yeah. Like that so too. so so see that's so. the whole game in dentistry. Because when you start telling someone they have, you know, they need an MO and a DO and an MOD, they don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. But when they say, you know, you guys have been here since 1988, it's second generation, they've seen all these faces for 5, 10, 20 years, then they accept treatment. And that's, that's why you see things when um, someone comes into your office from advertising, they'll spend a dollar. Um, when they're sent in by trust, they spend $3. And then you ask the dentist, well, what is your, what is your case acceptance uh, rate? They have no idea. They don't measure that stuff. And then you say, well, what is, what is your case acceptance rate of um, a new patient from advertising versus a new patient referred word of mouth referral? They don't know any of that stuff. And then you say, what do you, what do you know? And they go, oh, I'm going to go see Gordon and, uh, on uh, Good Friday in Scottsdale and, and learn about all the bonding agents. And, and they all work. I mean, you know, if, if you're if you're 3M and you sell a billion dollars worth a year, if you're Ivy Claire and you sell a billion dollars worth a year, if you're, um, yeah, I mean, there's like five companies that sell a billion dollars worth of stuff a year in dentistry. Do you think you can sell a billion dollars worth of stuff if it doesn't work? Yeah, you got to be doing something right. Yeah, I yeah. mean, dentists got eight years of college. They're the most anally retentive. Um, paralysis by analysis. They overanalyze everything. And, and the lower the stakes, the more they'll focus on it. Like, like they want to go see Gordon talk for like 40 days and 40 nights on bonding agents from companies that all sell a billion dollars worth a year. Then you ask them any question about their business, they don't, they don't know the answer. Yeah. And you said, and you should have two brothers that are in business. Yeah. So now you got to, now you got to trust a think tank. Your wife owns her own business. And any of you, um, and how much business did you learn in your eight years of college? Pretty close to zero, I'd yeah. say. I mean, you know, I took some economics classes, but yeah. but that's it. By the way, have you heard of my 30-day dental MBA? I have, yeah. Have you heard it, listed any of it? Not yet. I just finished your book, uh, Business Made Sense. What's it called? Uncomplicate Business. <laughs> yeah, Uncomplicate Business. I, I went uh, with that word because when I typed uh, uncomplicate, you know, the red squiggly line comes underneath it, so it's not a word. So I dropped an Amazon and there's no book This is uncomplicated. So I said, that's my word. In fact, my next one's going to be um, um, think in abundancy. Um, and abundancy isn't a word either. It's abundance is a word, but not abundancy. It's part of my uh, born in a barn from Kansas uh, <laughs> uh, lingo. But uh, but yeah, so I um, I put that 30-day dental MBA. It's for free on iTunes. It's not on the Dentistry and Center. It's a separate iTunes show. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, they say I look much better on iTunes than YouTube. And uh, so if you listen on YouTube, you have to uh, turn your phone upside down. But uh, It's on Dental Town too, isn't it? Yeah, it's on Dental Town yeah. too. Um, um, it's on Dental Town, but um, um, just... So, so you got two 
so you're at a fork in the road and you got you got to take both forks. You got you come out of school, you got to take the road of clinical dentistry and then you got to take the road of um the business of dentistry. And and I really recommend uh, that your spouse gets heavily involved with that because it's it's a huge communication error. Like say say like people say like the wife will hear, "Well, how much do you charge for a crown? $1,000." And then you'll come home and you'll say, oh, yeah, I did five grounds today. I did four yesterday. I did three yesterday. So she's like, five grounds today, that's 5000 She doesn't realize that in America, the fee, they quote all the people calling the phone, how much is a ground? They say $1,000. And then like 98.5% of dentists take Delta, and it's a PPO. And then the adjusted production, they might only be getting 700 for a ground. So okay. the wife here is 1000 but you're only getting 700 Overhead, 65%. And 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 the margins, and then she's thinking, well, hell, if he's got five. If you need five thousand dollars a day, let's go to Maui this weekend. I mean, let's just let's just kick back to Maui. So you have to see that. Uh, and by the way, I always ask you, well, what 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 do you not like about the most about your business? Oh, I don't like all the PPOs. Well, what do you want to build? Because only half of America has dental insurance. You say, I want to build the cash market. Okay, so you want to build the cash market, but. 95% of all the crown you did was at a PPO price is 700 and everybody with cash, you say it's it's $1,000. So that's an economic barrier to entry. I mean, everybody knows if you want more of something, lower the price. If you want less of something, raise the price, have the government tax it and regulate it. I mean, like San Diego. Uh, San Diego used to be the tuna capital of the world. All tuna, biggest tuna cannery, and then the California legislators decided that the um, that the um, the canning plant was environmentally friendly, so they outlawed it. So so San Diego went from the tuna capital of the world to it doesn't even that I mean if you there's no way to place to even clean the tuna. So instead of working with business where they say, well you know this is ugly, but if we just ban it, well all it's going to do is move down to Tijuana. So how, how does that save the environment? So everybody in California loses their job and then you just move it across an invisible line sky. So when government works with the business, say, how can we try to clean up this process? Because when you just do the California thing and, and close it down, it just pops up you know, on the other side of, of the wall, the, the invisible wall that Trump's building in Tijuana. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, so you guys both getting on the same page Communication, seeing the books. Does your dad use a CPA? Uh, accountant? Yeah. Yeah. And does that accountant specialize in dentistry? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, I think the dentist, that, so the dentist, the, the accountant that he works with, um, he's been with for quite a while. I'm quite positive that he works with a lot of dentists. Um, and I've talked to quite a few accountants too that, that specialize in working with dentists as well. So that, the U of A, this, the university I went to, is pretty good about that. As, at least um, they bring a lot of the accountants that work uh, specifically with dentists to the school, and they have us come and talk. They have them come and talk to us. They have different vendor fairs where we meet with different, yeah, financial people or accountants or insurance people that specialize with dentists. You know, if you were going blind, you'd want someone who specializes in ophthalmology. If it was just your retina falling off, you'd want somebody who only specializes in retinas in ophthalmology. And when a dentist switches to someone who only does dentistry, oh my God, I mean, just on average, their overhead drops 5%. Yeah. Because it's not just the math, it's the art. Because you know what you know, but we don't know what we don't know, and a lot of things going on. Like, like, like right now, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, when I graduated from high school in 1980, the economy fell to the ground, interest rates were 20%, unemployment, inflation were double digit. And then it got better, and then I graduated in 87, May of 87, then October of 87 was Black Monday, the market lost you know, 500 points in an hour. And then it was really good from 87 all the way to uh, March of 2000. That was about the longest stretch, is it 13 years? And then, boom, the internet bubble popped. And it wasn't just the internet bubble, it was really the Y2K bubble. Because all those cells were going up because everybody wanted to redo all their computers before the Y2K thing. So at Y2K, everybody was done. So sales stopped January, February, and March just collapsed. And then the next one was um, just this last one, 2008. So now it's 2018, like, it's been a decade. So in my walnut brain, I know humans are crazy. 
and they make very bad decisions. And what the reason there's a business cycle is because people make malinvestments, whether it be in agriculture, real estate, stocks, bonds, cryptocurrency, whatever. So, so it takes so about every 10 years, there's this massive correction because we're all crazy and we don't know what we don't know. It's the same thing with that CPA specialized in dentistry. Um, a lot of, they just, after they've done this 10, 20, 30 years, they know this works and this doesn't work, yeah. but they always can't explain that on a statement of income, a balance sheet, and um, a statement of cash flow. So getting someone who just only does dentistry, and then when you go to those meetings, some of those people, like they're, what's the uh, big one in uh, Dallas, Texas, the accounting firm uh, in Dallas? Um, uh, Kane Waters. Yes. Yeah, Kane Waters out of Dallas. They only do dentistry, but they, they have a rule. When when they do their year-end report, it, they want you in there for a day, and you have to bring your spouse. And you say, I don't want to bring my spouse. They discontinue as a client because they've been doing this for 30 years. They know what happens when the dentist is going this way, the spouse in the other room, and they're like, you know, we don't, we don't even want to work that way. So, the, so you got to be very transparent with the personal budget, the dental budget, with your dad, with legal, all mm -hmm. those kind of things. So what what are you passionate about in the clinical? What are you um what 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 did you do in dental school that you said, man, I could do this? I mean, your last name's Orth. Why aren't you in ortho school? <laughs> I mean, My you're wife. second I generation mean, not reading your last name. <laughs> My wife, which is I was, I think she. <laughs> My wife just wants to go. What she wants me to specialize somewhere so we can live somewhere cool, cool for, for a couple a year. years. Yeah, or two. But I don't know. I don't. I so far um, part of the reason I got into dentistry is because you know my dad was always coming home. He was talking about these different technologies that he was learning about. How excited he was about the CE he was learning about. And when I started looking into that, you know, I'm kind of a techie guy, a little bit of a nerdy guy, so. That was part of the reason why I was attracted to it, because it seemed like there was so much cool stuff you could learn and so much cool stuff you could implement. So as far as dental school goes, I mean, we weren't exposed to that much of the interesting technology out there. We did some, um, you know, some CAD CAM stuff, which I thought was really cool. Um, I'm looking forward to learning more about CAD CAM when I get out in private practice. Um, Does your dad have a CAD CAM? Yeah. So he's what been, does he have? Uh, he has a CEREC, so... Does he use it? Yeah. How often does he use it? I think he uses it. I mean, I've, the times that I've been in the office, he uses it every day. Every day? So That's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, Does he like it? Yeah, he really likes it. So for him, I know that he feels it was a really good investment for him. He, does, he do the, um, does he do all the scanning, milling, staining, glazing? He does it all himself? Uh, I'm not sure if what his assistants are doing. What, is that what you mean? Like yeah. if his assistants are doing part of it or not? I, I'm not sure what parts his assistants do and what parts he does, but, but when I've seen him do it, I've seen him do the scanning and, and then obviously the, the crown insertion too. So, But not all the stuff in between. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's doing that or if he has an assistant that's helping him do that too. Because that's where I think it goes incredibly wrong. When the, yeah. when the dentist is doing all yeah, the I steps. Mean, you, yeah, yeah, when you buy this expensive machine to become a lab tech, dude, you don't even have to go to dental school to be a lab tech. If you want, if you want to be a lab tech, cut your income in half, go be a lab tech. But, you know, if you turn your assistant into yeah. a high-tech job, uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's the and way I'm, it And works. I'm not sure, maybe they're scanning too. I, you know, the ones that I've seen is the ones that, I've watched him do a few that he said were more complicated cases where he was scanning and, you know, ones when they start getting really deep subgingively, then, you know, it's a so, harder scan. So where does the name Orth come from? What kind of... It's a German name. So there's... Orth is German? Yeah. And does so, well, it mean my, something? I don't know. I can't remember. I've looked it up before. I don't, I don't know. know why I'm looking at you, <laughs> but... Um, so did there's... You, did you take his name? Yeah. And you didn't Google it first? No. I mean, my gosh. What a mistake. Definition yeah. Orth. It just says Ortho. Uh, straight, rectangular, upright, combining form, denoting substitution at two adjacent carbon atoms and a benzene ring. Uh, yeah, they don't have orth, but it's German. Greek is orthos, so orthos in Greek means straight, right. So I guess it. Comes so, to so that. you're on the straight, narrow path. Is that what it is? You're I straight. Guess so, yeah. You're straight and right. Are you right wing and straight? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so there's you you are an orth. And there's also there's uh, Australian orths too, but we're not related to the Australian orths. So I have, a, I have a cousin who's an orth. He just went to dental school in Australia. And he met some Australian orths too, but they're not related. Maybe really distantly, I guess, but yeah, but they're not the German orths. 
Yeah. Um, so, um, are you thinking about grad school? Uh, I don't know how seriously I'm thinking about it. Right now, I'm just enjoying being done school. Yeah. So, my plan has always just been to work for a few years and see, you know, how much I'm liking it. If there's something I really desire to go back to school and do, then, then I would consider it. But, but at this point, I'm not really thinking about it too seriously. You know, another thing I love um, um, bringing new grads on, because I like to talk about people at all different phases of their journey, and um, a lot of older dentists like me or DSOs are looking to employ the youth, and you got to look at the um, associate turnover in private practice and um, in the DSO space. The, the turnover is insane. And, and then combine that with the fact that millennials, their turnover is insane. Like, so, so like in our generation, like my mom's brother got a job at Mobile Oil when he was 16 and he retired when he was 65. I mean, he had one job from 16 years old in Parsons, Kansas, till he was 65. And they moved him around the world. And um, you look at the, um, the, the greatest companies to work for, fastest growing, most of thing, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, their average millennia only stays one to two years. So then when you go into dentistry, a lot of people say, you know, everybody that works at these DSOs, they'll quit after a year or two. Do they quit after a year or two in private practice? So the reason I like to keep beating that message in is they always say, and he's already said it three times, they're attracted to mentors. It's why Heartland has the slowest turnover rate with associates because they just have all this um, continuing education that you yeah. can get on five-year tracks a year, FAGD, or become an implantologist or starting work. So if you get a job at, or at Heartland, you say, well, you know, my, my, my goal is I really want to be learn to place implants. Great. We'll give you a, all the hours and CE you need. So they're staying there and learning that. And that's what um, Facebook does. So, you know, if you work at Uber and all you're doing is driving cars or you're a programmer at Amazon, all you're doing is shipping. And one of the reasons they keep you at Facebook because I'm going to say, well, you know, I've been doing this for a year and I'm kind of bored. I'd like to learn this. Well, Facebook, they can move you to all these different tracks to say, well, go spend a year in, in um, virtual reality or and, and they're, they're in, now they're starting a crypt coin. So, so if you want to attract the young and retain them, they want mentors. They don't want silent owners. Uh, they don't want them um, to be in there with two kids and um, dumb and dumber. Neither of them, uh, one breaks off a root tip and the other one's like, I don't know. You know, they, they, they want mentorship. Well, uh, I would say too, like my class was right around 40 people. Um, and I'd say almost all of them, that's exactly what they're looking for. You know, they're looking for going, they're looking to go somewhere to get experience where they're going to be able to do a lot of procedures, but also somewhere where the dentist that's working there is going to be able to work with them closely and, and be a good mentor to them. So, And another th thing that the young kids overlook is um, they, they need to learn business. I mean, you've already said you got zero business training in school. And then they go work at Heartland, and I say, well, tell me all that you learned from business. Oh, I didn't learn anything. It's like, okay, so Rick Workman runs 800 offices, and most dentists can barely run their one office that they're standing in the middle of 40 hours a week. Really, there was nothing to learn from a company like Pacific, where Steve Thorne's running 500 offices. I mean, so you know, it takes systems and systems and systems to do that. So uh, it's, it's a great place to learn business. And part of the curriculum at the U of A, where I went to school, I mean, we do have a couple of practice management courses, but, but I, yeah, I would say the general consensus is that we feel like we don't really learn much about and who would you say is the biggest practice management guru in Alberta, Canada? I'm not sure. What about Canada in general? I'm not sure either. It, email me, Howard at Dentaltown.com, and tell me who you think the number one Canadian, homegrown, local practice management consultant is. Uh, it be interesting to hear. Because I do know, um, you know, um, countries are very different, and... and Within the United States, I, I don't even like the term United States of America because it makes no sense. I mean, like, it'd be like no one refers to Europe as the EU, uh, the European Union, because there, you can't compare anything with Germany and Greece. How do you compare Portugal to Sweden? I mean, it, uh, or Italy to Denmark? I mean, so the United States, how do you compare New Orleans to New York City? 
or Anchorage, Alaska to San Francisco. I mean, it's the United States, even the Federal Reserve. You know, when they started the Fed, Fed Bank, um, because in the 1800s you kept having banking crisis after banking crisis, and the government really didn't want a, pri a central banker, but they didn't want to have a depression. You know, they had, I don't know how many depressions they have in the 18th century, like three or four. So they started a central bank, but one of the things they did is they broke it up into 12 regional banks, the, the board of governors, like there's one in Minneapolis, there's one in Kansas City, there's one in San Francisco. And um, that's really what the United States is. The United States, I look at the Federal Reserve map and that they got it about right. It's basically 12 countries flying under one flag. And, and um, so um, like, like I know in your area, advertising and marketing is still a very taboo subject. Uh, there's a yeah. there's a dentist up there in Red Deer named uh, Yar Zuck, a very good friend of mine, and um, and then then one of the, some of the saddest feedback I've ever got from my 30 day MBA when I launched that in '98, back when it was on VCRs. Have you ever even seen a VCR? <laughs> have you ever Have you ever even held in your hand a VHS tape? I have, yeah. Really? Yeah. What well, was that? Your fifth birthday party? <laughs> <laughs> and some dentists, um, dentists around the world were doing this stuff, and then they found it was illegal. I mean, dentists in Hong Kong and places you wouldn't think, why are they so concerned? Like Romania, it's like, why are they so concerned? But it's just healthcare and business is very taboo, yeah. and you you are in a very taboo place. So, yeah. so having that inherent trust from your father handed down so that when the engine light comes on, um, everybody... When my engine light comes on, I know it's the idiot light. And I'm just hoping that the guy talking to me, I can trust because I'm, I'm an idiot. I, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know how to verify it. So so how conservative is, is the lack of advertising in Alberta right now? Pretty conservative, I would say. I mean, that's something we learn in school, too. So there's the ADA and C, the Alberta Dental Association in college. What do you, what do you call that? ADA and C. A-D-A-N-C? And, and, like, and C. Oh, ampersand and C. So Alberta Dental and Alberta Dental Association and Oh, so college. it's ADA. Yeah, and college. Yeah, so yeah. Alberta Dental Association and college and college. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's the regulatory body that governs Alberta, um, and they're the ones that enforce. Yeah, I would say across Canada, it seems like the strictest advertising guidelines and, and things like that so and, and why, why, do you, why do you think that is I think it's exactly what you said I mean I think they're worried about I think they're worried about you know the prestige or, or the professionalism of dentistry going away you know they're worried about it just being seen as I guess like a car salesman you know and I, I don't know what it's like in, in America. I assume it's a lot different. I know it's even a lot different between provinces in, in Canada. But, but yeah, I think that's probably what they're concerned about is that they don't want us to be viewed as anything other than a professional. And they don't want the trust of the patients to go away because they see all this. Which is really so funny because it's, it's exactly, they say they don't want to be a car salesman. No, you want to be a car salesman. The car people sell the average American from age 16 to 73 a new car every five years. So the average American will buy 13 new cars. I mean, they sell 17, 18, 19 million new cars a year. And the Americans will finance over five years and they'll, they'll, they'll buy a new car and the mean average price of a new car in the United States is 33,500. And then you go to Alberta, Canada and say, hey, Alberta, Canada, how many of you sold one $33,000 treatment plan in your entire life. No one raised their hand. And it's like, so they go in there and they go, I don't want to be a used car. So they look at a mouth on fire, gum disease, cavities, and then they go, well, well, the very worst one is this one. So let's just go to the shittiest tooth in your whole head. And, and then your insurance, you start talking about false gods. I mean, um, well, your insurance, why would you bring up the insurance? When you go buy an $800 iPhone, no one mentions insurance. When you go buy a new car, 13 times in America, no one mentions insurance. When you go buy a house, no one mentions insurance. You know who makes insurance what it is? It's the dentist who don't want to be a used car salesman. They're the first ones that bring it up. Well, I'll tell you, Trent, you got 32 shitty teeth, but 
This is the one you're pointing to today. This is the one that's hurting and broke. And your insurance, 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 makes the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Insurance Company, will only give us $1,000. So let's just treat this one tooth. And then next year, December 31st, when the new pagan ritual holiday comes out called dental insurance, we'll get another thousand and you'll have sacred permission to proceed. So yeah, they should be used car. They should be car salesmen. And I would and, say too And that. when you look in a mouth, the people selling all the dentistry, they go in there like a new car. Could you imagine taking in your old car and they say, well, Trent, let's just replace your wheels. And the next year we'll replace your engine. And then next year we'll reupholster your car. And over the next five years, you'll have a new car. They just, the, the, the dentist, 5% of dentists sell that average price of a new car once a week. They block, they work Monday through Thursday to five. Friday, they go into that big case. It might be an all on four, which is uh, 25,000 arch. They might be doing upper and lower, it's 50. It might be taking out everything and replacing it with Empress glass, veneers, bonding, whatever. But one out of 20 dentists, and if you don't believe this, what you do is you call Care Credit. They have Care Credit in Canada. I'm not sure. No, uh, it, it was owned by GE. Now GE's in complete turmoil. They they got they were way overexposed in the 2008 deal, and they really haven't recovered. Uh, and uh, Alma is uh, going to go down. And he followed Jack Welch. Never follow the greatest businessman in American history. You know that's going to set you up to fall. But anyway, um, and um, you go to Care Credit. What I love most about Care Credit is Care Credit will go in there and show you all the dentist offices in your city, county, state, and how much money they're financing here. So they'll go to your office and say, well, you know, uh, they don't have any money around here. It's a poor area, you know, where uh, this is like Somalia and there's no money. And they'll say, really? Okay, well, there's a dentist um, three blocks down and he finances $50,000 a month. And you've done 500 a month for the last 10 years. So really, and then these people, I, I was loving, I was, um, um, whenever, whenever we go on vacation, uh, whenever I see a dental office, I always stop and go in. So I was in San Diego last week and I, I saw a dental office in uh, Maricopa. Saw another one in Gila Bend. When I was visiting my mom home in Wichita. I was driving around, uh, stopped at one in Derby, one in uh, Rose Hill. And, and it was so funny, I was having lunch with this dentist in this really small town of like 2,000 in Kansas. And he says, well, you just don't understand, there's just no money out here. I'm really? Because we're eating at a Mexican restaurant where we're in, laying out the window. I say, uh, well, you know, there's a Circle K over there, which is like a 7-Eleven. I said, how, how many cars and trucks are in the parking lot? And he counted me, he said, seven. And I said, and how much is each one they got? They were all seven Ford 150 or Ford 250 trucks that were between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars. So here you are in Rose Hill, where there's no money, and I'm looking at, gosh darn, fifty and hundred thousand dollar trucks. And then when we walked over there um, afterwards, um, they're 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 Kansas, they're hillbillies, they're born in a barn, and they're getting inside. I mean, these F 150s you can't even imagine because Mama's big in Kansas, you know. And she's grabbing that old deal. She can barely get into the truck. I mean, she has to lift her leg two and a half feet. And it's like, so they got $100,000 for a fully decked Ford 250. And then this dentist has never sold one complete dental case in his whole life because it's the dentist thinking with his brakes on. And that's what Alberta is. You know, um, when, you, when you talk to people, um, they say, um, why is America great? It's the biggest paradox in the world. Why is America the greatest country in the world? Because for 500 years, people voted with their feet and said, I'm tired of these other worlds. I'm, I'm going to come here. So then you say, okay, so, so we should open back up Ellis Island and let in unlimited immigration? Oh, no, 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 no. No, kill it now. And you say, okay, well, that don't make any sense. That's, that's the dumbest. The only way you could get America's economy to grow 3 or 4 or 5% a year again like it did for hundreds of years was unlimited. just open up Ellis Island. And then the second thing you say, so, so you like competition? Do you think you should, McDonald's should have a law that only McDonald's can sell hamburgers? Oh, no, man. I want, I want Wendy's and Burger King and In-N-Out Burger and White Castle. I want all kinds of competition. And then what do they do? Every industry runs to Washington, D.C. and tries to get trade production for steel and aluminum and all this stuff like that. And then your dental society, oh, well, we don't like competition. 
We don't like advertising. We don't like you to talk about prices. And then that doctor's wife's on the phone calling around, shopping on price, ordering online to Amazon. And they say, you know, when you order batteries on Amazon, they um, um, when you're on voice Alexa, they don't even, won't even tell you the name brands. You'll say, Amazon, I need AAA batteries. And they'll say, well, Amazon's got a 16 pack and they, they won't even say the brand because they're all knockoff generics. If you want to actually see the brand, you got to go to Amazon.com or Amazon Prime and then you have to scroll down and then you'll find out that the two biggest brand names charge twice as much as all the knockoffs. So here's these dental boards wives buying all the brand names, all the knockoffs. Millennials, by the way, um, if they're going to get credited for anything um, for their generation, I think the number one thing they're going to get credited for is the death of brands. When they want a AAA battery, they don't need the little Duracell. They don't need the little the little icon. A battery is a battery is a battery. And uh, so, so these dentists are hypocrites. They're they they they're uh, they immigrated to Canada and they're against immigration. Uh, they want competition with everybody that serves them, but they don't want competition within their own. And they always make fun of people who sell stuff. But you know, the guy selling you the F-150, he thinks it's the hottest truck in the world. And if you say to him, well, I'm thinking about getting a Toyota. Oh, God, no, my God. you are. And he's passionate. You, when you go into the Apple store, the, the guy working at the Apple Genius Bar, I mean, he can't wait to help me. He knows I'm a grandpa and blind, and he's showing me all this obvious stuff that, you know, you're... Uh, four-year-old granddaughter could figure out. Um, but when, when dentists tell me they, they don't like to sell dentistry, it's like, yeah, you hate dentistry. You only do it for a job. You ought to get out of dentistry. You shouldn't trade your life for money. It always leads to depression, disease, drinking, drugs, everything like that. You should only do things that you love. And it's I always tell my boys, the thing I'm most proud about professionally is I've never worked a day in my life. I worked with my dad at Sonic Drive-In from age 10 to 20. I mean, you go to work with your dad, your idol. You got free hamburgers, cheeseburgers, onion rings. There's a bunch of beautiful car hops running around. As opposed to what? Go home with my Catholic mom and five sisters who are always either playing school or church or station of the cross or saying the rosary. It was just a blast. And when I got to dental school, I took all those courses because it was so fun to learn. And I just always, and, and whenever something didn't become fun anymore... I always moved on to something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I've oh, I've been playing for fifty five years. Well, I hope I can say that too. Well, you should uh, because because look look look, look at the, like the laugh ratios. Like, you look in um, middle school and high school and college, everybody's laughing and having fun, and and you look at the little kids at five years old, everything's funny. I mean, I've seen read studies where they laugh over three hundred times a day, and then by the time you're forty, it's down to three times a day, and you look at the happiest people in society, they're always. In high school or college, single, no relationship, no job, no children. So he's like, no, 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 you got to get married, have five kids like your dad, and you got to get a job. And then you're like, oh my God, this is horrible for like 25 to 65. Then finally your kids leave home, you retire from your job, and you're like, well, what the hell is that? So what I tell people to do is just slow down, man. The, the, stress and, uh, the, the stress of having five kids versus two, the stress of working uh, five and a half days a week versus four, just slow, you know, that what well, you don't realize when you want to buy that Ford 150 truck, you don't realize how much blood, sweat, tears, and guts you're going to have to spend for that. So a life of minimalism. I can't believe dentists get a boat. My God, how many idiot friends do you have with a boat? All you got to do is show up with some food and a case of beer, and it's a free boat. Why do I need a cabin? Half the dentists I know in Arizona have a cabin. I can stay at a cabin for nothing. Why would you buy a cabin? Yeah. And then people say, well, I really like San Diego. I think I'm going to buy a house. Dude, you're going to come down here once a month for, the mo for a week, once a year. For the money you're going to spend in that cabin, you could get a deluxe suite at the Marriott with room service overlooking the ocean. And now you get to your cabin in the first three days, you got to clean and vacuum and, and the roof's leaking and, you know, it's just, uh, so a life of minimalism. Keep the We're smile. We're about that. We like minimalism. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> so, so what, what forks, or what questions do you have uh, for me? Um, I've been, uh, you say in your book, you talk rather than compete with dentists around you, form relations with them. Um, that is so, uh, I'm, I'm glad you wrote that on your question. Um, so, well, I was going to talk about my next book if I ever write one. Um, um, think in abundancy. 
and I know it's not a word, um, thinking hope, you know, optimism, the glass is half full, getting fuller. Um, when you go across the street, um, I would split the dentist. Uh, it depends on the place, you know, like, I know I'm biased, but I still think the South is far more warmer than New Jersey and New York. I mean, you know, I've lectured in both of those places a hundred times. I mean, you can't, yeah. if, if you think the nicest, sweetest, good old boy dentist in your, that you're ever going to meet in your life is from New Jersey or New York, you probably have never left New Jersey or New York. I mean, yeah. they're just not, it's like the complete opposite end of the spectrum in Louisiana. I mean, it's just, but, but when you go across the street, if he, if he thinks in abundance, he knows that what he's competing with is iPhones and Ford 150 trucks and trips to Disneyland and, and all that kind of stuff. And he knows that a rising tide lifts all, all ships and, mm -hmm. and working together and having fun and feeding off each other's ideas. And you want to surround yourself with those. But the man who thinks in fear and scarcity, he's toxic. And, and, and he's always going to drag you down. And you're going to be a summary of the five people you hang around with the most. So, you know, the dentists I hang around with that were within a mile of me, my God, they, I mean, they would do anything for me. I could give them one of my patients. They, they'd send it back. I mean, just, I mean, I, I have patients coming in and uh, saying, I'm going to sue that dentist because this didn't work out. And I said, calm down, Spanky. And then I'll redo it for free. I'll say, I'll redo it for free. If you just knock it off, okay, you know, just, just, you know, shit happens. Um, and, um, and same thing with learning implants. Like, why do you want to fly from Canada to a thousand miles away to learn how to place implants when there's a periodontist, an oral surgeon in Alberta that have placed 5,000 implants? And then when you place an implant and you totally screw it up, if, if, if that guy was a jerk or you didn't know him or whatever, and then he, that person went to the board or the attorney or whatever, it could, it could steamroll into something. But when you send it to your buddy, he's the guy on the board and this and that. He just yeah. fixes it. So when you go knock on the doors, you're going to tell. I mean, um, it, it's a character trait. And they probably have had it their whole life. Remember in dental school, there were, there were people who would help you do anything to pass the test. And then there were people who wanted you to fail because they, wanted to, they were gunners. Yeah, and and, know and, <laughs> and they're called gunners because you just wish you could get a gun and line them all against a wall and shoot them all because they're they're I mean they're just mental midgets and so you want to find out who are the gunners that would throw you under a bus that they could get ahead one percent and who yeah. thinks in abundance and and um, and then sometimes your friends change over time um, you know when you're single all your friends. Uh, or single, then you get married, all your single friends go away, now you're all a bunch of married couples, then when you start dropping frogs, uh, you know, the, the, the crowd keeps splitting. So you, um, another way to do it is um, don't buy your supplies online, buy for a rep, because the rep can't rep 60,000 items, but they can tell you who's fun and cool, and then you tell them all about you and yourself and your wife and dog and cat and whatever and they start finding the dentists that are like that the next thing you know you got a really good buddy who's an ended on us who will let you sit down in a chair and when you got three hours open on tuesday to go watch a uh, molar endo and and periodontists and oral surgeons and, and 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 the orthodontists i beat up the orthodontists the most because i think they of all the nine specialties they think in fear and scarcity the most there's no doubt about it and um i just don't see Anything they say or do with pediatric dentists, oral surgeons, and adonis, they're just a completely different breed of cats. So that's why I always like to remind them that when I go around the world and I see um, um, like um, Derek Mahoney in, San, in uh, Sydney, he, when he saw clear liners come out in Visline, he said, I know these guys are going to do it. And he says, and I know that they don't know how to do it. And I know after they do it for three or four years, half of them are going to quit doing it. So he started a deal where, you know, it's like uh, every Thursday at the, at the end of the day, bring in Invisalign case and I'll help you. Oh, so what does he have now? Oh, so he grew his office from a little one orthodontist office to now in Sydney he's got north, south, east, west. In each one of his offices he has four orthodontist associates. He's doing like, oh, I think it's, uh, it's something crazy, like $50 million a year. So you go around all these countries. I, I've seen it in Cambodia. I've seen it in Indonesia. I've seen it in Tokyo. I've seen it in Hong Kong, Singapore, London, Paris, where these guys think in abundance. 
And so a guy like you comes and knocks the door and says, you know, I want to learn clear liners. Come on down. Because even if you do all your clear liners, you're not going to do your class twos. You're not going to do your class threes. You're not going to do open bites, long faces. Yeah. And this guy is going to be working on diagnosing and training plan. Because in, in healthcare, you want to get an A in the diagnosis and training plan. It's okay if you get a C on everything else. But what's really horrible is when you get an A on the root canal and an F on the diagnosis because it was the tooth next to it. You know, you, you never yeah. want to do perfect treatment on the wrong diagnosis. And so they start really working with you on diagnosis. So now you go back and you see all this work though. So now when, when you see this kid sucking its thumb at five years old and all this, and so you see a lot. So as you start doing work though, and someone's mentoring you, now you start diagnosing and referring a ton of ortho while you're doing a bunch of ortho. And it's back to that, when you think in abundance, everyone's glass gets fuller. And when you think in fear and scarcity, just like just like a trade war, like, like um, you know, if this country really wanted to go back to nationalism and knock off free trade, you, you couldn't even, you couldn't imagine how fast this economy could contract. I mean, you gotta think in hope and abundance. America can grow its economy well, the rest of the world grows their economy. It's not like, well, for us to grow, you got to go down. Like for your exports to go up, China's exports don't have to go down. There's a reason they export so much more than we do. Why don't you work on that? You know, and one of the reasons um, our exports are so slow, again, it's it's lack of immigration. Like people say, well, I don't, I don't like when I call the company in the call centers in India. Oh, so you mean you want to open up Ellis Island so those people in India can come here and answer the phone right here in America? Oh, no, no, no. I'm against immigration. And then you say, why? You say, well, I don't like foreigners. Well, go talk to a Native American Indian about, uh, about uh, immigration. You know, you think you were born here. Uh, you came here, there were 20 million Native American Indians and the European imperialist settlers. It wasn't the government. It was, it was the settlers. They exterminated... 19 out of 20 million American Indians they did in Canada, they did in Australia. Wherever European settlers went, the first thing they did is clear the land of the indigenous people. And if you don't want to accept that or believe that, you're crazy. But um, but find the dentists who think in abundance. Just go knock on the door, pretend like you're running for mayor. Yeah, that's one thing. Well, that is one thing I really liked about the book because I've thought about that. You know, there's seems like everywhere I drive now, there's so many dentists. And I think because I am a dentist, I notice it a lot more. But yeah, I really like that part about the book. And that's one thing that was kind of concerning for me because, you know, living in, I did my dental school in Edmonton, which is three hours north of Calgary. You know, you get to know a lot of the specialists that come in and work with the students at the school. And I almost felt jealous about my classmates that were staying in Edmonton because now they had all these good relationships, you know. And a lot of them, like a lot of the oral surgeons would say, hey, like, Come, I'll teach you how to do wisdom teeth or, you know, come shadow me anytime. If you have any questions, my door is always open. So that was, yeah, that was a big thing for me is moving to Calgary. How do I form those same relationships with the specialists that are there or even the other dentists that are there? And so Now, is your dad introvert or extrovert? I mean, he's been there 30 years. He probably knows who all the... Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he has a lot of... I know he has the certain specialists that he refers with. I know he's a part of... You know, different study clubs but, but, that he but, works but with. But some of those, some of those specialists, they'll refer to thirty years have a very dysfunctional relationship. They're not even aware of. Like, yeah. like you'll find a dentist says, "Yeah, I've used the same CPA for thirty years." Okay, great. Well, here's a blank sheet of paper. Just write down the three different accounting statements. Doesn't know. Yeah. Okay, dude, it's a statement of income and P and L. It's a balance sheet. It's a statement of cash flow. Tell me the difference between a statement of cash flow and a, and a P and L. Oh, so this guy, even for he's your friend, right? Yeah, he's your friend. He's kept you completely in the dark. You're somewhere between yeah. Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles. You're somewhere between blind and deaf and or dead. And um, so um, if your referral relationship is a friend that doesn't want you to grow and learn, because um, I want you to send me all your root canals, so yeah. I'm not even going to help you on any endo or talk about technique or, send it or, or call you up and say, dude, why did you send me this? This is a, it's a bike custom with one root. Why are you doing this? Yeah. Well, I'm just not quite sure. Well, then come, come over here, you know, on Friday. I'll schedule a patient on my day off Saturday and you can be my assistant. Yeah. So, I mean, moving to Calgary, that's, that's a big thing for me too, is yeah, not only having a mentor as my dad, but also trying to figure out, yeah, what type of specialist or dentist. I and then there's another, another category, which uh, it's funny because, um, so 
Where did our hockey team, Phoenix Coyotes, did that come from Alberta? Or where did that come from? Ryan, where did sure our Phoenix Coyotes, Coyotes come, come from? from? I don't think they came from Alberta because we have the flames and the orange there. Oh, here, well, I'll, Google. I'll to Google. That's why God made Google. <laughs> and uh, by the way, um, um, I think it's so funny how uh, everybody's focusing on Facebook and privacy issues and all that kind of stuff. It's such a, it shows you, if the humans are on it, I mean, it was Mark Twain said, whenever you agree with public opinion, you're on the wrong side of the fence or something like that. And uh, Facebook knows all your data where you post all your greatest hits, your greatest Winnipeg. photo. What is it? It was the, they joined the NHL in 1979 as the Winnipeg Jets. The Winnipeg Jets. And um, so Google, you're, I mean, so on Facebook, you're saying, oh, here's our five-year anniversary and we're in love. But Google is God. That's where, you know, you pray for help. You're like, uh, divorce attorney, f top five signs uh, you're getting a divorce or your spouse is cheating on you. So Google has been sitting there the whole time with their lips shut because, holy moly, they have your truth serum. Facebook is your, like, what it was. Facebook was the yearbook picture mm -hmm. at Harvard. Facebook's your greatest hits album. Google <laughs> is is your truth serum. I mean, there, there's people in there Googling all kinds of stuff. And now, um, and now they're doing voice. So once you do a voice search, you've given them permission to turn on their microphone whenever they want. Mm -hmm. uh, and Alexa is already, um, they're already solving murder cases with Alexa. Because they're going back on uh, people um, who you're a suspect, and then they'll go get your, your audio files. It, it was crazy. I was in my first um, jury duty deal, and I had to go there for three weeks. And it blew my mind. They were asking you a question. They are saying, uh, uh, hey, Trent, you know this girl named Layla? Nope, never heard of her. Three seconds later, here's six audio phone calls of you talking to her. Were you, did you know that they were doing drugs? No, oh, really? Well, here's all your texts you sent her. And they were bringing up, well, and what was really freaky, they're like, well, six years ago, this is what you said. And I'm like, they, they've got every Everything. conversation you've ever had. So transparency um, is dead. But if you think face, Facebook would be the tip of the iceberg, Google would be what sunk the Titanic. I mean, they got a, a just amazing. So uh, I can't believe we only went out an hour and ten minutes because I keep babbling. Um, any any other questions you have? I don't think so. No, thank you for having me today. No. And if you're a homie in Canada, um, um, bring it in. And I want to tell you one thing. Oh, but the reason I was going on this sports still, I got out lost on a tangent is when hockey teams move from Winnipeg Jets to deal. That's business. The NFL, if they could get the star player from another team with a better deal, they'll steal them. They're always stealing and all that kind of stuff. And it's taboo in dentistry, but it's really good business. One way you can get your mentor and make a lot of money is let's say you work on um, Monday through Thursday. Say, say you do four 10-hour days. And then Friday, you load up all your molars, molar endo, or all your implants, or all your Invisalign. Then you go to that three-hour drive away. Because see, you drive three hours from, uh, you're in Calgary, yeah. and three hours away is Edmonton. Yeah. Yeah, so in Edmonton, there's uh, Mormon dentists who have five kids at home and a stay-home wife, and it's competitive, and they want more money. And they're like, uh, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you drive three hours and then I'll split it with you 50-50. So then they'll come down and you've loaded up your six implant cases for the week. Maybe they're all individual. Maybe it's an all-on-four that you and your dad combined no way you could do. And now he's in there doing an all-on-four for 25000 arch, but the, the four implants may be charging 1500 a piece. So he's getting three thousand, you're getting three thousand, but you're watching in your own deal, and that is a growing. That's one of the fastest growing business models in the United States. Um, and like I say, I don't know the dental insurance market in Canada, but in the United States, the insurance companies have a much higher fee schedule. So, so all these uh, corporate dental offices. And by the way, when we talk about corporate, eighty percent of corporate dentistry is is uh, two. I'd say 20 offices, 
It, it's it's kind of like the press. All they talk about is the Fortune 500. The Fortune 500 doesn't employ 15% of America. The main, number one employer that employs 80% of America is a small business administration, 25 employees or less, doing a million dollars a year, and a dental office is exactly that small business. It could be a wheat farm, a dairy farm, you know, a clothing shop. That's America. And um, and um, so when they um, um, when they these insurance companies, so it'll be like a group practice, and there'll be like three dentists in there, and they're billing their molar endo, and they're only paying them six fifty for a molar endo. But they have an endodontist come in, and the same damn insurance company will pay them twelve hundred for a molar endo. So like shit, I'll do it for six hundred, but if I have an endodontist come in, I can bill twelve hundred. I split it with him, I get my six hundred. Didn't even do the damn molar root canal. And then you look at uh, these, uh, one of the reasons these big heartlands are expanding so much and some of these other changes is because they can buy your dental office. And let's say they finance over five years. Just the fact that they can go back to the insurance companies and negotiate higher fees, the difference between the fee you were getting and the higher fee over the next five years was what they paid for your dental office. And then a lot of these um, a lot of these people will buy a dental office where they get critical mass. They'll say, okay, I'm gonna buy your dental office in San Diego. Well, we already got five dental offices in San Diego. And we went and found endodontists in other markets that aren't busy enough or hungry enough. And we're and, and, and by the way, when you come out of school and you're an endodontist, why do you wanna go buy a land and a building and build a dental office and go another million dollars in debt when you could go to Calgary or Edmonton and find the five biggest offices in town and say, I'll come and do your molar and then I'll split it 50-50. So now you come out of school, you got your student loans. And then if you're smart, you're gonna live, move back into the mom and dad, live for free. And now you're going in these offices getting 50%. So your overhead is zero. And that is the fastest growing business model. And you see it first in the most competitive markets like California where their best idea was to open up another dental school. If five weren't enough, they thought, you know what? We're going to double down on dumb, and we're going to open up our sixth dental school. I mean, God, um, and, and Phoenix is like that. When I got out of school 30 years ago, Arizona didn't have a dental school or Florida to water. Now it's got Florida to water, uh, AT Stella Mesa, Midwestern in Glendale. They're dumping out 218 dentists a year. And then our adjacent states, like Nevada, didn't have a dental school. Now they got two. Yeah. New Mexico didn't have a dental school. Now they got one. And so that's gonna make a change. Now, it's gonna, that's why dental income has been dropping about 3,800 a year since 2009. And, um, but it's still at 174, which is three and a half times the average combined average household in America. So no one's gonna cry over for that. But it's a plus for the insurance companies and it's a plus for the consumer. So as it gets competitive, they're going to rural markets that are smaller. They're maybe more likely to open up evenings and weekends. Uh, the insurance companies are getting far more participation. Uh, but if, as insurance becomes a bigger and bigger game, you really have to start dissecting the fee schedules. And if they're hell bent on paying the specialists 30, 40, 50% more for the same procedure, then a lot of times the best business decision to make is to have the, the specialist come into your office. So then you get a mentor in your deal. It, you have a relationship. It's a 50 50 relationship. Um, you get to go in there and observe. And, um, and, and then when, if you start doing something, something goes wrong, you got a buddy that's coming in once a week that can do this kind of stuff. So with that, any final questions? No, I don't think so. How about you, Layla? I'm good. Thanks for all your help. I know that Trent has said a lot of good things about you and you've helped him out a lot just with your book and your podcast and stuff. So. Well, if he was a true fan, he'd cut his hair just like mine. <laughs> and uh, That's the next step. Is that, is that, <laughs> and, I, and we were talking about your name is Layla because uh, she probably doesn't remember this song came out before she was born, but uh, when she said her name was Layla, um, you guys don't know, it was one of the greatest songs when I was a kid. The song was inspired by Eric Clapton's love for Patty Boyd, the wife of his friend and fellow musician George Harrison of the Beatles, and Clapton and Boyd would eventually marry, and uh, and when Layla was first released, it was uh, not successful. And you said your mother named you after that song. My dad. It was one of his favorite songs. Oh my God, Eric Clapton is uh, is just uh, the yeah. one, one of the greatest musicians. And I only have one Eric Clapton joke. Okay. And it's so bad. <laughs> Ryan, should I do my Eric Clapton joke, or is it just too bad? It's way too bad. It's way too bad. Thank you, Eric, Brian, for that, uh, that uh, saving your dad for himself. Um,
tell your father that I said, man, tell Kim what a great job, man. He raised sure. a fine son. Thanks. Thanks Best of luck yes. to you. you. You guys are married three years. Yeah, I hope you make it uh, 103 years. And uh, Godspeed, guys. Thank you.